This podcast is sponsored by A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London and Middlesex, both family owned and operated. By Hyde Park Care Pharmacy. Experience the difference an independent pharmacy can make for you and your loved ones. Hyde Park Care Pharmacy offers personalized care, short wait time, very competitive pricing, easy transfer of your prescription, and much more. And by Molly Maid. During these times of COVID-19, it has never been more important to keep your family safe. With the healthy home cleaning system, Molly Maid London is here to help. Make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Maid London today. Today, Kevin, Rob, and Ian are joined by guest host Elspeth Dodman. Together, they welcomed poet, novelist, and professor Daniel Bowman Jr., a New York native, Daniel lives in Hartford City, Indiana, where he is Associate Professor of English at Taylor University, Editor-in-Chief of Relief, a journal of art and faith, and Faculty Advisor to Students for Education on Neurodiversity, or SEND. His book, On the Spectrum, Autism, Faith, and the Gifts of Neurodiversity, debunks myths with a realistic yet hope-filled deep dive into the heart, mind, and life of a Christian. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever and wherever you may be listening. We welcome you back to another edition of the Vickers Crossing podcast. The Vickers Crossing is a virtual space where faith intersects with the public square. And we're glad you're back with us in our fifth season. We have a wonderful guest today who will be joining us in just a few minutes, um, Daniel Bowman Jr. And we're going to be talking about his book, On the Spectrum, Autism, Faith, and the Gifts of Neurodiversity. We have a guest host today on the Vickers Crossing, which Ian is going to introduce fully in just a couple of moments. Um, But first, we introduce ourselves to you. As always, I'm Rob Henderson from Holy Trinity St. Stephen's Church here in London. I recognize you. Yeah. You are Rob Stevenson from Holy Trinity. I've Rob been around. Stevenson. Rob Stevenson. No, no, Rob Stevenson. No, you're Rob Henderson. You don't know who I am. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm Kevin George. I'm the rector at uh, St. Aidan's Anglican Church in the northwest of London, where I hang out with two other folks who are on this screen. Uh, I have the privilege of introducing myself first. My name is Ian. I'm a singer, songwriter, producer, editor of this very podcast that you're listening to right now. And our Sunday morning digital deacon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that as well. I'm, I'm, I'm a lot of things now. And who's this up here in the corner? Elsbeth, you want to oh, say yeah, yeah. something, Elsbeth? <laughs> yeah, speak. I, I'll introduce you formally later, but oh, you can on. introduce oh, yourself see. now. I see. Okay, uh, I'm Elsbeth Dodman. I'm from London, Ontario. I uh, go to St. Aidan's with Kevin and Ian, and uh, yeah, it's great to be here I'm at my house. Awesome. Awesome. We're so glad you're with us today. Um, Before we go on any further, though, we want to just take a moment and offer our land acknowledgement, and Kevin's going to do that for us here. Yes, indeed. We uh, here at the Vickers Crossing want to acknowledge that our podcast is recorded on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabeg, Haudenosaunee, Lenapewak, and Attawandaran peoples on the lands connected with the London Township and Somber Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. This land continues to be home to diverse Indigenous peoples, First Nation, Métis, Inuit, whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors of our society. And we continue to work and long for the day when we know and experience together true reconciliation. We have uh, three wonderful sponsors who are so faithful to our podcast and we want to thank them and acknowledge them today. First to A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London Middlesex, both family-owned and operated. Many thanks to Dave Mullen for his great support, and we say hi to the whole gang over there at A. Miller George Funeral Home today. They're a deadly lot, that crowd. And um, and uh, I just got a text message from Dave today suggesting there could be beer involved in my future. That's so a good guy. Those are the kind He's of sponsors you guy. like to have. Yeah, that's, okay, that's, I'm just saying. That's, that's, a, that's a pretty, like, average guess no I'm I'm not... a, those people are my kind of people pay attention <laughs> trisha lister True. and carol basada <laughs> okay so so to hyde park care pharmacy locally owned locally lo- operated and locally loved you can get your prescriptions moved over there without having the awkward moment of going into your old pharmacy and saying i'd like my prescription back i'm going somewhere else you just need to go see carol she it's all in the some sort of a 
provincial act. She picks up the phone and calls the guy that you used to awkwardly have to go see and gets your prescription. And then you start getting drugs from this beautiful independent pharmacy right here in the neighborhood, locally owned, locally operated, locally loved, Carol Basada. Go get your drugs there today. And last, but certainly not least, you want to say a special thank you to Molly Maid. Make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Maid London today. Trisha Lister was the wonderful one who hooked us up with that. Um, and and they'll come in, clean your house, clean your whatever needs cleaning. Your oh guitars. Boy, that's that's your tough guitars? right there. Yeah. That's tough right there. Those are shiny guitars back there. I got to tell you, she she I, I to be fair to Trisha and the beer conversation, she has had beer delivered to my door. Well, see, wow. Wow. these are our kind of sponsors, our kind of people. <laughs> well, before right. we get going, oh, no, Ian, sorry. I was just going to yeah. say, would you please introduce our yeah. our guest host today? Yeah. So yeah. I have the yes. privilege. I have the privilege of introducing Elspeth Dodman. Elspeth is a 33 year old autistic Londoner. She has her B.A. in fine art history and anthropology from the University of Toronto. Wow. And, is, and has a postgraduate certificate in autism behavioral sciences. Uh, Elspeth has been giving public talks and presentations on autism uh, spectrum disorders since she was 18 and lives at home with her parents and two cats. Uh, she is also alumna of the Vickers Crossing. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, fun fact, she has been interviewed twice and officially on the podcast once and is also the fantastic, wonderful graphic designer, artist, human being of our logo that is on um, everything. Mm -hmm. So this is the wonderful human being that Yay. we have as a guest today. We all love Thank Elspeth. <laughs> can, Ian, Ian yes. can you tell why we actually interviewed Elspeth twice? Uh, and, but only aired it once? Like, what happened? So, <laughs> way, well, was this season three, I think? Way back. Yeah. Um, back when you were still in person, um, uh, I, I was recording on my laptop, and I thought that I was recording the audio file podcasts are large audio files mm -hmm. and i thought i was recording the audio file into an external hard drive i didn't realize Ooh. that i didn't have the external hard drive set up properly and um it all got wiped it was like the file's too big to record and i didn't realize that um and it was just not there um and we had to record God it again. God bless Elspeth cared <laughs> enough to yeah. come back and do it again. Come yeah. back and do it again. I, I and cares enough to, to be and cares enough to be here today. So thank Absolutely. you for doing this, Elspeth. How are you feeling? Thank you so much. I'm feeling great. Thank you for having me. It's it's great to be back. It's good to see you all again. Hope you're all you've all been doing well and uh, staying strong through this time. Uh, mm -hmm. I I'm glad to see that uh, Vickers Crossing has continued uh, in in this online fashion uh, as we move through. Uh, COVID times, the second of the plague years. Yes, um, that's, right. Wow. <laughs> yeah. that's right. Frogs and pestilence next. <laughs> <laughs> moving that's on, cool. we're moving on up. We got to move on up. Cover. Yep. yep, big time. <laughs> well, we're so glad you're here today, and uh, um, we're going to include you in, our, in, in a very special segment here we do in the Vickers Crossing. Kevin and I yep. usually spend hours and hours preparing this, so we hope yep. you and hope our listeners ready. enjoy it. This is a segment Jeez. that we like to call. Uh, hey, 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 Kevin. Yeah. Uh, who, who, the heck, who the heck did you book this week? Oh, who the heck did I book this week? Drum roll, please. Right. <laughs> there we go. We got the drum roll there in, folks. Through. That's good. Oh, yeah. So this week, I'm happy to say that we have booked Jonathan, Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove. Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove is a Christian writer and preacher who's graduated from Eastern University of Duke Divinity School. He's a best-selling author. He's out on the front of the Poor People's Movement. Uh, he works with the Reverend William Barber. Many of you have seen on, you'll see actually uh, Jonathan on CNN and ABC, but now you're going to see and hear him on the Vickers Crossing when he's offering insights with us. And from here, I'm sure his life and his career are going to take off. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we'll be yeah. very excited. Uh, he'll be coming on later on in November. Uh, he's excited to be with us. He's already been tweeting about us. So thank you, Jonathan, for doing that. We look forward to yeah. having you on the podcast very soon. That's who Perfect. in the heck we booked this week. Now, wasn't that exciting? That was exciting. Very. And it will be. And you know what? We actually booked someone today, which is why we're here. And uh, his name is Daniel Bowman Jr. And he has written a book that looks like that. And it's yeah. called um, On the Spectrum. Autism, Faith, and the Gifts of Neurodiversity. And so if y'all are ready, we're going to uh, bring him into our Zoom room here, and we're going to talk to Daniel on the Vickers Crossing podcast. Whoa. Looks like 
Daniel. And we are back on the Vickers Crossing and so happy to welcome in our guests today from Hartford City, Indiana. We want to welcome Daniel Bowman Jr., who is the author of this great new book that we've been enjoying and looking forward to talking to the author on the spectrum. There it is right there. Daniel, how are you and welcome? Thanks so much for having me. I'm doing well. That's great. We're so glad you're here with us today. We're, we, we, uh, we've been enjoying your book that we received just before the summer. We we're going to have you on a little bit earlier, but some things happened, and we're, we're glad that we finally got a chance to connect and chat about this and much, much more. So thrilled to have you here. I know our listeners will, will be learning a lot and enjoying this, and, uh, and so we're glad you're here, and I think Kevin's going to kind of kick us off yeah. with our first question. So everything's okay in Hartford City, Indiana? The, like, how's your COVID and all that? Like, uh, suppose that got to ask, got to ask nowadays. <laughs> yeah, the COVID number's not so great uh, yeah. out here, but you know what? We're 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 working through it as best as we can. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, listen, I have another very important question. Did Mike Pence come home? <laughs> uh i boy i sh i don't know <laughs> i'm pretty blissfully unaware of his whereabouts <laughs> good that's a good thing for you. parts unknown he's gotten a parts unknown okay the, like the rest like the wrestlers of days of old he's from parts unknown all right listen enough joking aside here um you know, we all loved your book and it's a beautiful memoir. You're very vulnerable in this book, Daniel. You okay, share a lot sure. of yourself and, uh, and give a great sense of, um, of what it is uh, to be uh, uh, neurodiverse. It's a good book for folks who are neurotypical. Uh, um, and uh, as I've heard from our friend Elspeth as well, immensely helpful to neurodiverse folks. What I found fascinating in your case is that being diagnosed, was that of being diagnosed as a person on the spectrum so much later um, in life? You weren't uh, diagnosed as a kid, which is what we all sort of think of. And I know we've had Elsbeth on, on this podcast before talking about issues for uh, adults with autism, uh, right. because so much of the services, at least here in Canada, are directed towards kids, you know? Um, yep. So you, you write in a book in the in the preface or in the the, the, uh, the early part of the book about your blog post, your first blog post after you had a confirmation of your diagnosis. And it's a very telling and powerful little post. I wonder if you could read that post for our listeners. And I'll have a question for you on the other side. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, this came about when I was writing for Ruminate magazine out in Colorado. Uh, Fort Collins, Colorado, and I had an opportunity to do some blogging for them for a little while, and uh, I knew that I needed to start writing about autism, although I had no idea where to begin. I just wanted to start asking questions and exploring it, so this little excerpt is dated uh, from the fall of 2015, and it says, I am autistic, and I'm ready to write about it. I'm ready, I think, but the topic overwhelms me. It will take multiple essays to start a proper exploration. <clears throat> in her 2014 memoir, Cynthia Kim wrote that since her diagnosis, quote, in a way, I've been forced to relearn how to be me. That feels right. The facts of being me have not changed, but the meanings of those facts have undergone a great shift. Quote, a sea change into something rich and strange, to quote famous lines from The Tempest. I still don't know what to make of this shift, even after diagnosis, even after reading many books and articles about the autism spectrum, talking with therapists in a small inner circle, and considering this all in journaled words that will remain private. I don't know where to begin, but I know what I feel and have always felt. Alienation. An estrangement so powerful that I barely feel like a person sometimes. So I guess I'll start there. When I read that, I was really taken by, um, I like, I just think those last words about alienation and about estrangement are so incredibly important. Your book of poetry, you, you mentioned this in that introduction as well, uh, is titled The Plum Tree in, the, in Leather Stocking Country, which I ordered in June and still haven't received. So I'm, oh, I'm, cha no. I'm, I'm chasing these people down now. Um, it's a book of poetry, but the title, as you've noted in the book, is really meaningful because of this, this bit about uh, alienation or, or uh, estrangement. 
I wonder if you can discuss that a little bit for our listeners about that feeling of isolation and that metaphor of that, that plum tree. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, you know, I guess I didn't understand what that image meant to me when I first uh, wrote about that. I was just compelled by the image at my grandparents' house uh, in upstate New York. Uh, so I grew up not far from the Canadian border, actually. Uh, when I was a kid, we got um, CKWS out of uh, oh. Kingston, Ontario. <laughs> okay. <laughs> did you so get to watch? Actually, did you get to watch the Romper Room too? And Mr. Dress Up on CBC? Did you get those? Uh, no, we had oh, Romper Room. <laughs> okay, all right. all right. I think I remember watching Degrassi High. Oh, Degrassi Junior High. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so we're in upstate New York, and you know it's a cold climate, uh, and we get a ton of snow uh, mm -hmm. up along the New York State Thruway. And my parents had, or my grandparents had a plum tree in their yard, and um, I just always found it strange. You know, they had an apple tree right, right next to it, and that made more sense for the climate. The plum tree seemed really uh, fragile and delicate for such a, a climate. Um, and like I said, I didn't really know what that image meant to me. I just knew that it really was compelling to me uh, when I was writing about it in terms of the book of poems. Later on, I decided maybe it kind of stands for um, people whose existence is uh, somewhat fragile in the, in the wake of a um, difficult landscape. And maybe that could even include autistic people. Um, in terms of the alienation, you know, I was thinking about that earlier today. I, I think, you know, for one thing, I'm, I'm hyper empathic and hyper emotive. So mm. I'm just feeling everything so intensely every waking moment. And I think that's going to serve to alienate you because I just, um, as they say, I have no chill. Right. And <laughs> that's a hard way to live. Everybody else seems to be like, hey, man, what's going on? And it just kind of <laughs> yeah. just can you can just go through your days and things are normal. For yeah. me, nothing's ever normal. It's very intense. It's very sharp. My senses are very sharpened. And so I have uh, sensory processing issues with temperature and, and sound and, and uh, bright lights and all kinds of things. So yeah, you feel so different from everybody all the time. Yeah, that maybe I ask here, uh, Elspeth, do you, do you relate to what Daniel is saying there? Absolutely. There was, um, there's times where uh, sound just sort of wipes out your senses, like it, it just, it, you, someone's talking, but they're, they're, the noise just sort of wipes out everything in your head. And mm -hmm. it's, it, sometimes I wonder if neurotypical society, like I, I almost want to flip the script. I'm not actually sure how much of the world you guys are actually interacting with because you don't <laughs> seem to acknowledge any of it at all. No. <laughs> There'll be things that happen around me and the, the neurotypicals around me are like, yes, that's, yeah, well, I'm, I'm here, and that's okay. <laughs> and I'm like, a bomb has just gone off. Or is everyone, okay? is everyone what's, okay? What's happening? Do we have to call someone? Is this an emergency? <laughs> and everyone else around me is like, well, it's it's another day. I'm like, yeah. I'm very worried yeah. about you. I'm very worried. <laughs> how much? How much of um, of the world do we see? And on the other hand, it, it can be rather confusing because I've lived this way all my life. Right. So. Uh, how much do I just assume what what am I really seeing differently and what what am I not I I, I don't know um we we have had a difference of experience in that I, I was diagnosed younger and I'd, I'd been under the microscope from a really young age uh but yeah even even the transition um getting the diagnosis at 14 mm. um still very to, still very isolated isolated even before, even before the diagnosis, it was isolating. Uh, but after the diagnosis, having to re-examine everything that you thought was a part of your life. Um, I remember uh, one of my parents saying, I, I finally was able to stop blaming you. Mm. Um, uh, and so, yeah, it, it does cause you to step back and reevaluate everything and, yeah. and say, you, you start tracing the lines back and, and realizing where you are. So yes. Mm, that, that's so powerful. Yeah. Um, 
and, and I think that's the thing. We blame ourselves for it because we don't know where else to look. And it seems to be us that's having the hard time. And yeah. why are we struggling when everything's, you know, no one else is struggling with these things. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's so, so hard. Yeah. 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 Well, I was going to ask you a bit about um, something you wrote about in the in the book um, about how others have spoken to you about autism, and you're mentioning some lines from people around the church, even. Um, and Kevin and I work in the church, so we're around it all the time, and uh, Ian and Elspeth um, are, are around it as well. So um, that that people have said um, to you, I was just going to read a little bit of a sampling that you wrote, um, like someone said to you. Uh, oh, gee, I, I would I never would have never known. known. You don't look autistic. Um, or are you sure you have autism? You just need to learn to relax, smile. Life's not that bad. God is in control. <laughs> um, oh, you got to love that one. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I think you mean a person with autism saying autistic is offensive. Oh, yes, it is. Very and offensive. here's my, here's my favorite been, one. I've yeah, been told that online a number of times. <laughs> oh, have you? oh, my gosh. <laughs> Unreal. Unreal. And then this is my favorite. Uh, well, gee, I guess we're all a little autistic, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was, oh, yeah. That's yeah. it. So yeah. anyway, I wish I wish this was uh, really hard to believe. But like I said, we were around the church a lot. So we hear people say things sometimes that we just go, oh, my gosh. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, you go on to say in the book, I was just going to read a little quote here. Now that some people in my faith circles know I'm autistic, it can be frustrating to communicate the nuances of what that means. People often say things that are hurtful or reductive or simply betray a lack of understanding. Um, I've heard them all. I sometimes feel like I've been dubbed ambassador of the autistic community, that I'm supposed to model healthy autism and the integration of autism and faith, gently teaching anyone who's interested. That's a lot of pressure when my emotional energy is consistently near drained. And yet I still feel traces of shame for not being uh, up to the task. So, Daniel, what's your advice to to those that follow in the way of Jesus um, about helping free autistic followers of of that sense of shame? Mm, yeah. Um, I you know my first impulse is to say just hear our stories, read our stories, uh, listen closely. Um, not just because I think you know you should learn about this certain subset of human beings, but I think you'll learn a lot about how to love your neighbor, no matter who that person is and what that person's gone through, if you're attuned to their way of being in the world. And so I think the first thing to be able to do, and this has really been the most wonderful experience for me, is when, when people say, yeah, I picked up the book and I read it, or they even read the blog posts way back before there was a book. And and said, you know, you said this thing that, that was really intriguing to me. Um, tell me more about that. Or now I have people that I'll go out for coffee with and they'll be like, do you like where we're sitting? Because I realize sometimes you've said before that if the, the sun is too bright, you're going to uh, struggle. Let, just let me know and we'll move places. And so things like that, just being kind of attuned to the experience is, is so amazing. I never expected that to happen. I went through, you know, 35 years or whatever of that not happening and me feeling like the weirdo for having different <laughs> types of needs. Um, so I guess listen, listen to our stories, read our stories, and at least try to um, kind of break through if you can. I want, I myself want to do that for everybody. Yeah, I like that. And I like the notion that, you know, because I think there's something, I, I think there is something to be said for, um, the removal of ignorance, right? And I don't mean that in, in a rude sense, but in the sense of, of not knowing. And I think that yeah. one of the things I think that's really powerful about your work, not just in this book, but, but your work as a writer and a professor of writing is that, you know, it helps dispel a lot of this. And I've seen this with Elspeth as well here in, in our own community that, you know, once people are able to be in relationship with people uh, who are on the spectrum, there's a different understanding and there's, and once you, it's, it's like every other ignorance, once it's peeled away, there's at least there's the opportunity for growth and for listening and for some positive response. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I love that. And I appreciate that. And again, I, I keep making that point about this book that it's not just about autism or it's not just my story. It's about, I think a path that can help us love our neighbors better. 
uh, 100%. Now, with that in mind, one of the things that you talk about in the book is service and about finding your place for service. And one of the, the one of the other real cool things about your book is that it's it, it addresses faith, which a, a lot of the stuff that you read out there doesn't do that. And when you when you're writing about yep. being a part of a Christian community and so on, um, you point out that there are so many church uh, activities that have sort of that ableist attitude or bias, right? Like, I mean, the assumption is that anybody can plug into this, right? So here's the sign up sheet or, oh, well, I need somebody to jump in. Hey, how about you, Daniel or Elspeth? You can do that. Or, or I think you point out in the book, like uncomfortable things like, come on now, we're trying to fill up the front. So come on, Elspeth, get out of that chair and come on up the front. Bro. We want you. you know, that, that sort of thing. Right. Um, but when you write about that, you make, you write about making decisions about when to say yes and when to say no. And really, for me, when I read it, I thought, well, what an incredible insight around discernment. And again, this is powerful in the sense that it, it helps those who are on the spectrum, but it helps those of us who are neurotypical to say, look, here's somebody, here's somebody modeling. modeling. Oh, I just got me back. Here's somebody modeling for us what it looks like to see where our gifts are. You write this. Autistic people have to forge a new path forward every single time a unique path that takes into account the levels of all our equalizer sliders, mental, emotional, and physical energy. Each depletes more quickly and erratically than for neurotypicals. Alone, recharging time, uh, alone recharging time, sensory inputs and comfort level, temperature, clothing options in a wide variety of situations, sounds, lighting, smells, singular or multiple sources of each type of sensory input, uh, duration, time of the day, whether or not we're being valued for our strengths and accommodated for our needs rather than excluded or perceived as for perceived deficits and so much more. I have to own this reckoning completely and differently every single time. When I read that, I thought, well, that is exhausting. <laughs> that is exhausting. And so what, and then you, you carry it a step further by actually talking about the body of Christ, about many members uh, of one body, um, and that biblical concept. Can you say more about the differences in discerning service for the neurotypical and the autistic, and how these differences can be explored as an embrace of the many gifts of the body of Christ? How what you're talking about here is a way of modeling sensible choices to be able to say no to things when they're not a good fit for us. Yeah, thanks uh, for setting that up so well. Um, Absolutely. It, it is exhausting. And that's, that's a big problem because, you know, um, if you have work and you have a family and you have um, hobbies and other things that you need to do, um, it's really, really tough to enter into some of these things. So I try to tell some stories about times that I failed and, and times when it's all, you know, most of my stories in the book are stories of taking two steps forward and one step back. And that's pretty much the trajectory of my, my life, whether it's service uh, in the church or something else. Um, it's so as far as the, the body um, and the members and all that, I, you know, I heard a lot about that growing up, but it always seemed to me that the members were somewhat um, indistinguishable from one another. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and, and maybe only in an extreme case, if, if, if somebody had, let's say, a physical disability, let's say you have a wheelchair user, um, you're not going to ask that person to hand you stuff from the top shelf, you know, or something like that. But I think um, in terms of it getting much more granular than that, I just don't see it a whole lot. And, and I think it could be a place where we learn much more about each other and figure out who's right in what situations. And that would take a lot of listening and a lot of discovery. Uh, but I think it could be really useful for, for anybody to articulate that stuff. Yeah, it's really cool. I think that in, at one part there, you take the Bible passage and you say, you insert the words uh, autistic and neurotypical for, <laughs> um, you know, the eye or the foot or whatever it was. And that, right, that was right. Really cool. Really cool. So, well, I was, it was a bit of a risk, I think, but I, it's, it's, um, it was a compelling idea to me anyway, to say, what if, you know, not to be pie in the sky about it, but what if we could get a little bit better at this for everybody? And then the exhaustion level, you know, if you felt understood and valued, uh, this is true of most people, I think, then the exhaustion level wouldn't um, absolutely deplete you. It, it mm -hmm. might be worth it, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How did you discover, change of 
change of topic a little bit. How did you mm-hmm. discover the neurodiversity movement? Um, so uh, at the outset of the book, I talk about a personal family crisis that leads me to do some more soul searching. And I mean, and I'm talking as somebody who already did a lot of soul searching. Mm-hmm. I was already going to spiritual direction for years and, and um, reading tons of books about um, the formation of the self and the psyche and all kinds of other things. I wanted to um, improve, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, but when I realized there are certain patterns in my life that I kept falling into and uh, that those didn't necessarily line up with how other people lived and what other people's needs were, um, I went down this rabbit hole of self-discovery where I just was looking through all these different things. Am I just depressed or am I bipolar or am I this, that, or the other? I don't even remember where I was on that rabbit hole uh, trail when I, when I got to autism. I can't remember where it happened. It happened online at one point and I just looked and I saw it mm. and I had been knocking on that door and seeking answers. And then there it was. And it made perfect sense to me. I checked all the boxes at that point I got really obsessed with it and you'll see this happens with a lot of autistics where the autism itself becomes a special interest and we want to learn everything there is to know about it because it's our operating system and so of course we want to be comfortable and understood and affirmed for the first time so basically this is going to sound weird but it's it's true I went to Twitter Mm. and everything that was labeled hashtag actually autistic uh which was uh um, which was a hashtag that was developed, you know, to, to, to distinguish and separate between people talking about their kid with autism or their nephew, or just talking as a teacher or a pastor or something to actual autistic folks talking about their own lived experience. Mm. And that's how I understood uh, the neurodiversity movement and really got into it and try to figure out, okay, what works for me? Um, and what doesn't. And I just learned so much from everyday autistic people around the world on social media. Wow. I see Elspeth nodding her head. Yeah. Uh, neuro- neurodiversity has meant a lot to, to me and, and to a lot of autistic people that I'm friends with and that I know. Um, for a, a lot of our, our time and interaction with uh, other people in our community, it's often uh, there's something wrong with you. There's a deficit. It's autism. You have to, you know, we have to look at this uh, as um, what skills do you have to build? Where are you lacking? What's, you know, there's something wrong with you. My first grade teacher sat down with my parents and said, there's something wrong with your child. Um, yeah. But uh, why? If, if there are many different types of bodies and there are many different types of people and many different types, why are there not many different types of brains? And to be totally radical and flip the, the table over, why am I damaged, bad, wrong, incorrect, needing to be fixed? Where, uh, and, that, and that's not to say that we're against um, seeking help for, for certain behaviors or, or to say that there aren't things that need to be addressed. There absolutely are. Um, but as a whole, I, I'm, I'm a whole person. And you see that earlier on in, in, in when Daniel was talking about people saying, you can't say that you are autistic. You have to say you're a person with autism. Mm-hmm. And this, this stems from institutionalization. When disabled people were in hospitals, And we were referred to as autistic or somebody would say, you know, cancer patient at Ward 12 or, you know, the Down syndrome kid in in room three. People forgot we were people. Mm -hmm. They they forgot they forgot our humanity. And so very quickly, they everybody scrambled and said we have to change our language. (laughs) We now have to lead with person first because we forgot you were a person. (laughs) And so autistic people came together and said, well, I don't see a problem. Autism is into dirty word this is very much a part of my my understanding of self and my reality and how I live touch see hear and smell the world around me I am formulating my reality through an autistic lens so I am autistic Mm -hmm. and people quickly rushed in and said no 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 you're a person because we forgot you were a person (laughs) 
So autistic people have had to carry that burden, that cross of other people forgetting our humanity. Mm. And, and so that there's that editing of language when in reality, that wasn't our sin. We didn't, we never forgot. We knew all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Elizabeth uh, pulled a couple of, uh, uh, she could, again, uh, that own voices thing, because I think that's, an, uh, that's a hashtag as well, right? Yeah. And yeah. so one, one of the reasons that, because Elizabeth is such a, um, she, a, a alumna of the podcast, but she also designed our logo. She's like so important around here that it was like, uh, yeah, own voices. We want to know when when Elsbeth reads your book, what comes out for her. So I know you've got a couple questions too, Elsbeth. So why don't I invite you to offer those? Yeah, um, I was I was reading the uh, part where you talked about family, and um, you mentioned uh, fear about raising children, and that's something that I know personally as an autistic person and as a woman, um, looking at the. Ex- expectation is for me to have kids but and you're saying how do I teach my kids social skills how do I how do I help my child navigate a social world when I need help navigating that social world I don't um how did you overcome that fear um it's tough you know it's it's so tough I don't know what I what I would have said if before I had kids, I was diagnosed and someone said to me, well, do you want to have children knowing what you know about yourself or how will you raise those children or whatever? I I just don't know. Um, A couple things that I'll say um, toward that, uh, the the idea of parenting everything. For one thing, I have a great partner uh, who is super, super smart and super understanding and very, very, very helpful. Um, so that makes a huge, huge difference to me. Um, also my, and I'm not, I'm not just like being a cheerleader, but also both my kids, honestly, honestly, are absolutely incredible. They're so different. Uh, we have a 16 year old daughter and an 11 year old son and their personalities are completely different. My daughter is actually a lot like me in most ways. My son is uh, fairly different from me and really, really fascinating. So just seeing who they've become and um, the whole nature versus nurture thing and and uh, what is it that they gain from us as parents and what is it that that is sort of genetically encoded or whatever it is, um, it's just fascinating. And I, I think, you know, the, the, the biggest thing that I try to do with this book really is be authentic in front of them and just be myself in front of them. <laughs> and say whatever you are is also okay, because if I can be okay being this thing, then surely I can figure out anything else. (laughs) Come to me with anything and we're good. You know, we'll work it, we'll work through it. That's what family does, you know, that's what family should do. Um, So it's been a journey, it's still tough. It's still tough, it's tough to be a parent no matter who you are and who your kids are. (laughs) Um, It's difficult, but, I've been super thankful. They teach me things about myself all the time and they provide balance for me. I think I, I, if for for me personally, if I were alone, um, I tend toward, you know, I'm bipolar and I tend toward the depressive episodes and stuff. I think I'd be kind of really out of whack a lot of the time, but because I have a little structure with family and, you know, every Saturday morning we get up in the fall and we go to their cross country meets. They're both running this year and things like that. Mm. It's structure and it's planned and it's organized and I feel good about it, you know? And, and so the biggest thing I can do for them, I think as a dad is, is be my best authentic self, you know? Uh, and for me, that means writing about it. Cause that's, that's who I am. Mm. Oh, there's, there's the unmute button. Uh, thank you. That that's really helpful. Um, it, yeah, this this is a question that's something that I've I've thought about in my own life. Um, yeah, uh, you know, on, on the spectrum. But it's good to hear from other people about um, how they've how they've answered that question for themselves, or how they've what they've uh, learned in their own experience. And I think that's a great way that autistic people can help and support other autistic people by being able to share um, their experience. Which I think is why yeah. um, having literature or having uh, blogs or resources is so important because there are other autistic people out there who think I'm alone in this or I don't know who to talk to or how to 
um, ask my questions and right. hearing from other people is is just so powerful. Um, yeah, and I, I was just going to add really quickly, as you well know, uh, Elsbeth, is the the fact uh, around children too is that people are talking about like prenatal screening for autism, mm. and yeah, that's yeah. frightening. You know, it they're is. looking at people like us and and being like, yep. maybe you shouldn't exist, or maybe wow. we shouldn't yeah. have more of you. Um, yeah. That's frightening, you know. And so a big part of me wants to say, no, you can do this if it's part of your plan and your desire for your life. You can have yeah. kids. And yeah. they can be wonderful citizens and just yeah. great people. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, just to just to share on that one, um, there's a, a current project out of Europe called Spectrum 10K, and uh, they are asking for uh, genetic samples, uh, so like cheek swabs and, and so on, from autistic people, and they're going to try to find genetic material, and it's the idea is leaning dangerously close to prenatal screening and genetic yeah. testing. And um, that is very frightening for autistic people and that threat's very real. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It might mean that in the future, uh, if, if a parent goes in for a prenatal screening test and the test comes back that, you know, you've met the markers for, for autism, you can choose to abort and and uh, mm. just uh, stop that birth. Well, I am um, pro-choice and, and think that, you know, I, I'm not trying to enter into a, an abortion mm -hmm. debate. That's not what we're here for. Um, I think one of the things for disabled people is that eugenics is, is a large part of our history and yep. it hasn't gone away. It's still something that looms quite large for us. And it's very troubling because uh, you know, Daniel and I could sit here and think, well, what if her parents had gotten that test? Mm. And what yep. choices would they have made? Mm -hmm. And and if not us, what about our friends? Mm -hmm. What about would I would I have never met Zach or mm -hmm. Sam? What about Kim? Would she be here? Would I have known her? And yeah, so that's, and, and yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's so important. And it's there as it, it's true. It's a backdrop and it hasn't gone away. And for me, I, I also just say, uh, not really tongue in cheek, but just in a very literal way, be careful what you wish for world, yeah. because, yeah. you know, do you enjoy that new iPhone that you're <laughs> playing around on? Because I guarantee some autistic people made big decisions about how to invent yeah. that thing. You That's need right. us. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Daniel. But I think it also uh, one of the things that's come up, and I know we're 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 going off on a tangent, but I, I do love those. Uh, even as we assess people's gifts, um, one of the people who is working on Spectrum 10K was saying, "Well, we don't really want to look at genetic screening because what we will lose, we stand to lose all these gifted people." But at the same time, neurotypicals not aren't wandering around like, and I am a mathematical genius and I built the best, but like- What do you mean? Not, I'm a but, mathematical genius. But like, it's, none it's of only you a genius of math that I even exist. <laughs> <laughs> but, but like no one else is, is being asked to prove why they should be born. No. If yeah. you, that, that you have to be a savant or a great genius or a, a gifted person. Most people are just, Pretty yeah. okay at stuff, and that's all, and, and that's okay. Can't we yeah. just be God's beloved and not have to do all that? Absolutely, you know? absolutely. Yeah. Can the foot be an eye? Can the ear yes. be, right. you know? <laughs> no. Um, oh, yeah. Speaking of so, church, Elizabeth, you got another one. I do, I do have another one. Segwaying neatly into <laughs> the next one. Um, I, re I remember I was in a classroom, um, actually it was, uh, it was the Autism Behavioral Sciences course up at Fanshawe College here. It's a uh, one year, postgraduate certificate. Um, a lot of the people were parents uh, seeking information about their young children. Some yeah. people were going on to uh, teaching. So it, this was sort of to further their, their education degree. Um, or some were PSWs who were, again, just going on to, to beef up that, that degree that they had. And we had a guest speaker come in and they were talking about um, an individual who was very active in the church and um, one of the students put up their hand and was befuddled that an autistic person could belong to the church, that 
were were autistic people not too logical to believe in God? Uh, yeah, we because we we sell that to people that autistic people are are so rigidly logical, and to this person that um, that seemed to fly in, in the face of faith that uh, you know that this could this could intersect. Um, is that something that you've encountered? And if you have, how did you challenge that thought? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <coughs> uh, it's interesting because, you know, I've got a, a SEND meeting this evening, actually, which is the SEND is, I write about it in the book, the um, Students for Education on Neurodiversity. And this is at a Christian college. And these are primarily autistic students. And they are believers and <laughs> followers of Jesus and yeah, yeah. autistic. <laughs> so uh, I guess just by our very existence, you know, it challenges um, those kinds of concepts. But I, I think it's true. I think um, so many um, in, in the popular imagination, especially, there's this link between autism and um, hyper logic, you know, and stuff like that. Um, sometimes if you um, look at, I mean, even something like Temple Grandin was such an important figure for so many years and kind of still is. Um, and she's logical and she's a problem solver and she doesn't, anything that's outside of the purview of logic and problem solving in her specific niche of, you know, animal sciences and stuff doesn't mean anything to her. Um, to go back to the idea of like an artist on the spectrum, I mean, I'm, hyper empathic mm. i just feel my way through the world i lead with my heart and my gut i'm not that smart i don't have a lot of logic going on most of the time to be honest i can't solve any problems mathematical or technological or anything else so <laughs> we're here and uh sometimes some of us you know have a childhood where we're brought into the church and somehow recognize our own personal need for for jesus and yeah it happens <laughs> yeah. I know Daniel in your book too, I was struck by, you know, you speak a lot about um, the importance of spiritual direction and, and, and in your life, you mentioned that already with us today. Um, and you write about how the symptoms of autism were, were missed in spiritual direction. I just wanted to read for our listeners, a, a small quote from the book and you're right. Looking back, it seems incredible to me that neither my spiritual director nor I recognize symptoms of what was then called Asperger syndrome. Yet that lack of awareness is indicative of the sheer absence of understanding of the autism spectrum, especially as it affects adults, even into the early 2000s, an absence that is only now beginning to abate. At the time, we had no familiarity with the terminology, how autism presented or why it might explain so much of my identity. If you'd asked me about it, I would have pictured a child, one with special needs, who was probably getting into trouble in school or sitting alone or rocking back and forth on the floor, or I have to say it like Dustin Hoffman and Rain Man. Uh, I wasn't a child with special needs and I wasn't a math genius, so autism never crossed my mind. So a couple of quick questions I get, guess on that. Can you say more about how uh, spiritual direction has been a help or even a hindrance over the years and, and maybe a thought on maybe how much that has changed in the last 20 years around uh, more awareness of autism. Yeah, for me, um, thanks again for setting that up so well. That's a great question. For me, um, spiritual direction always was useful to me. It always helped me, just like any kind of counseling. I think sitting down with anybody who is willing to listen um, as you process and hash out your problems, I think is, is useful and in, uh, in so many ways. Spiritual direction in, in particular with autism for me has been like this. I uh, focus on the details in front of me at a very granular level. And that's what I see and that's how I apprehend the world every day uh, through the five senses, through the heart and the gut. And it's, it's what's right in front of me. I can't see the forest or the trees. I see the trees up close every second. So once a month when I sit with my spiritual director and, I, and if I'm depressed that day, if a couple things have gone badly, 
I'll start talking about how bad everything is. And then she'll say, well, tell me about last week. Tell me about the week before. We haven't talked in a month. What other things are happening? And by the time I get the whole picture out, she'll say to me, Dan, um, it sounds to me like things are okay. It's just, you're stuck in this one mood right now. It's very temporary. It's just here right now. The, the bigger picture of things are, is going pretty well, you know? And she knows that she needs to do that because I've told her, so you know, I yeah. can't see the forest for the trees and I just have to keep giving you tree after tree after tree. And then you got to tell me what you see because I can't see it. Hmm. Um, that's been extremely useful to me for years. And then following up on that was the second part of that. Was it Rob? Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah. And again, I thought about how much has changed over the last 20 years around awareness of autism um, because there certainly has been that that change a bit yeah I, I think I think people would spot it a little more easily nowadays just your average yeah. person probably would spot it a little more easily I think they're looking for um, again they would have been looking for probably a white male who's very much a loner who is loves technology and is on a computer trying to you know write code or do some impressive thing um and sits alone in a dark room all the time and has zero social skills mm -hmm. um that, you know it, it, and that's just a small subset of how it might present in certain people especially people people who are hypo empathic and they don't um express emotions in a way that that generally are, is accepted or that people would be looking for right. um i think they would see nowadays um even just with the way that I use eye contact and don't use it in, in, in certain settings, somebody would probably pick up on that a little more quickly nowadays and say, oh, I see that um, your relationship with eye contact is a little different from a lot of the people that I know. Maybe there's right. something there. Right. Uh, the way I get obsessed um, with my special interests, somebody would pick up on that nowadays and say, yeah, that's probably, you know, it's just more recognizable because it's been in the culture more. Right. So I think they'd probably pick up on it. Are you, are you seeing it all in uh, in media um, uh, more um, uh, shows or or talk about about autism? I mean, I, I know there's a Netflix show yeah. that's really popular called Atypical, and yeah. that was that got a lot of press and stuff like that. Are you are you seeing some more of that in the mainstream? Yeah, it's really interesting. It, it's so obvious that that autism and autistic people are uh, of interest. Um, you know, because uh, Hollywood's making these shows and these movies. We had a show called The Good Doctor, mm -hmm. uh, which, yeah, you know, has an autistic main character. Yeah. Um, we, we had Atypical, which, you know, I think maybe ran four seasons on Netflix, and a lot of people liked it. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't particularly drawn to that show a lot myself, because when I first started watching, I'll tell you exactly why, I felt like they were centering the pain of the mother's character Mm -hmm. right away and asking yeah. me to relate to the mom as a character who's suffering because she has an autistic kid right. as opposed to centering the pain of the autistic character right away and yeah. i just thought eh, i don't feel yeah. great about this yeah. uh yeah. there's another show on freeform called everything's going to be okay uh which yeah. is an instance where uh this actress kayla cromer who is actually autistic is playing an autistic character. Imagine. <laughs> and yeah, yeah and, and they, they, <laughs> yeah. they called that the first time that they know of that that's ever happened. And so that was a real breakthrough. And Kayla Cromer is brilliant on, mm -hmm. on the small screen. I think she's just mm -hmm. incredible. Um, even if that show doesn't hit your tastes the right way, it's really exciting to see a character like that. So there's a lot going on. Right, right. That's good to, good to know. Yeah. Good to know. Uh, Elspeth has, uh, as our guest host, gets the final question before we That's let it. you go. So, I'm sorry, I, I'm tangenting for a second. I actually, <laughs> I have a, I have a small paper that I wrote on on autism in the media and social mm. justice. Oh. Uh, so we could be there for we could be there for a little while. Oh I'm yeah, gonna I love I'm gonna it. Focus. I'm going to focus now. I'm going to focus. Uh, Come on over here, um, Elspeth. <laughs> at the at the birdie. Uh, <laughs> How, how can the church be a champion for the neurodiversity model, just as the church is called to be a champion um, for anybody who's left on, on the social margins? We, we look at uh, a mm -hmm. Christ who, who has come to say, uh, be good to your neighbor, but also um, to really pull people into society, not, not push them out. How does the church mm -hmm. 
you know, as, as we look at these things, what's what can the church do? Um, you know, it makes me think of this line. Um, I, I've read a lot of Richard Rohr, uh, mm -hmm. the Franciscan writer, who I, I just really value him. He's sprinkled all throughout the book, so you'll notice mm -hmm. that I owe him a great debt. Mm -hmm. um, it, he, you know, he wrote in his daily meditation the other day that in religious circles, obedience is often a higher value than love. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of what the church wants to do, and I teach at a Christian college, and and I um, maintain the the right to critique it as as needed. I hope, but you know, it, it's tough. I think in those situations, when whenever you institutionalize religion, uh, whether it's at a Christian college or in the church, you're going to have a system and you're going to want people to basically fall in line with that system. <laughs> and, and that system is driven by capitalism and by a lot of other factors that aren't necessarily the love of Christ driving as a driving force. <laughs> so I think if we pull back from that and try to maybe get outside of it a little bit and look at what Jesus says, <laughs> um, the law and the prophets all hang on love God and love your neighbor that's right and that's right. so if we're going to be if we're go we're going to get so caught up in systems and trying to maintain our a, a certain image of the church or whatever we're going to lose people and so I think we have to focus on people more and that includes all of us who maybe are fairly awkward when we walk into your doors and you don't yeah. know what to do with us well we need Jesus too. And we're here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. For all the talk of, uh, for all the talk of love of neighbor, uh, the, the biggest principles that runs through Chris, uh, through scripture is to welcome the stranger. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. you know, and I mean, I think we often think about that in terms of immigration and so on, but right. I also I think it applies to those that we put on the outside of the margins. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not trying to say that Elizabeth is stranger to me. There is nothing stranger to me. Mm -hmm. However, but what I'm getting at is we do other people. And once yep. we've othered them, what does it look like then for us to remove those barriers that we put in place so that everybody is welcome, right? So yeah. it's, yeah. And, and that requires the sort of things that quite frankly, you write so well about in this book about, uh, you know, creating opportunities for people to be able to discern the ways to use the gifts they have, whether they're neurodiverse or, or, or neurotypical people, to be able to find a ways for all of God's beloved to fully participate in the body of Christ. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's one of the other great ironies that we experience on the spectrum where we're told that we we live under a very rigid, you know, we need everything to be the same. We live under a rigid sort of scheme of our own making. But then you look at institutions like the church or or education or society, and you have a neurotypical society that says it must be like this or you need to leave. And, you know, on, on the other hand, it, it's sometimes I feel like my diagnosis is more a reflection of the society that I live in rather than me, an autistic person. It's, it's, it's neurotypical society seeing a mirror of itself and not understanding it, um, mm. where, you know, we, we need you to behave this way. We need you to conform to this. We need you to be like this, otherwise, we don't know what to do with you and you can't be here. Um, yeah. And so for all of our supposed rigidity, we right. live within a system that is so rigid it can't, <laughs> it can't comprehend. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a great point. Right? Yep, perfect. Wow. Uh, hey, Daniel, thanks so much for spending some time with us today. We really do appreciate it. We appreciate your, your, your work and your book. And, and I know that our, our listening audience, when they pick up a copy of this is, it's really going to um, help them on the road to of, of discovering more, which is so important. And, and uh, because you were able to put yourself out there and be vulnerable and, and, and we appreciate that. So uh, on the spectrum, the autism faith and the gifts of neurodiversity is the book and Daniel Bowman Jr. has been our guest, Daniel. Thanks so much for being on the Vickers crossing. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great. You guys are wonderful. Thank you. Great. And again, yeah, thanks to Daniel. That was fantastic. Um, learned so much. And, uh, and I read this book because he gave it to us before the summer and we weren't able to get him on until later. So I haven't looked at this back. It was in June or something. Yeah. So I got to go back and, and, and uh, look at things again. And 
um, because that's very powerful stuff. And he's very vulnerable in it, as we said. And, and I, I really do recommend it to everybody to, to pick up a copy of that. So uh, thanks to him. All right. Thanks to uh, all of you guys as well. That was a really good podcast today. Yeah. It was great and to, to our very special, today. yeah, our very special thank guest you. host today. So thank you for being here too. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. It's, it's good to see everyone again. And uh, yeah, no, it's, it's excellent to be back. Great. Good, good, good. Uh, thanks to our sponsors again, to A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London Middlesex, both family owned and operated, to Hyde Park Care Pharmacy, locally owned, locally operated, locally loved, and to Molly Maid, make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Maid London today and get yourself cleaned up. And uh, that's it for the Vickers Crossing. We will see you uh, again down the road and more great episodes coming your way in season five. Bye for now. I'm Rob Henderson from Holy Trinity St. Stephen's. Kevin George, St. Aidan's. My name is Ian and our special guest is Elspeth. Hello. <laughs> and remember, Kevin, to always look both ways. Before you cross that street, splat. Thank you for listening. Our hosts are Kevin George and Rob Henderson. Our producer and composer is myself, Ian, with original artwork done by Elizabeth Dodman. If you have any questions or want to know where to find us, tweet us at Vickers Crossing or find us on Facebook at The Vickers Crossing. If you have any other questions about anything heard on this podcast, leave us a comment or look in the description to find out more. Thanks!